right, I guess I'll go first since I'm first on the slide. I'm Amanda Carter. Um, I have been uh, teaching uh, Bethel, at Bethel for three years now. I teach in the finance department. I am tenure track, so I'm full time. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, going forward. And currently I'm teaching investments, capital markets. I'm the faculty advisor on our student managed investment fund, the Royals Investment Fund. Um, and I also teach international business. Uh, previously I taught managerial finance. My background in industry is, uh, I was in, I'm from the East Coast, I was in New York. I guess my biggest job there was trading derivatives at uh, JP Morgan. Um, and then I worked here uh, at Parametric for 13 years, uh, everything from a risk man management job to running one of the uh, trading desks uh, for institutional clients. Um, I think that's all I'm going to say. Oh, my undergrad's in econ, which I actually think is very important, and then my uh, MBA is from Wharton in finance. Uh, I'm Colin. Um, so I joined the University of Minnesota in 2014. I moved here from Philadelphia. Uh, that's where I did my PhD, was at Wharton in finance. Uh, before that, I was in Canada. And I did my undergrad and master's there. I worked in uh, Toronto for a little bit, uh, both as a proprietary fixed income trader um, and then also as a quantitative analyst at a real estate investment bank. Uh, I teach uh, in undergrads, master's students. I used to teach part-time MBA students uh, at Carlson. Um, I'm also tenure track, uh, but I don't teach uh, nearly as much. Most of my job is towards research. We'll talk about the difference between sort of, I guess, teaching tenure track and research tenure track in a bit. Um, not much more to say than that. Happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, sure. So these are sort of uh, just splitting out, dis uh, distinguishing the types of faculty there at a university, okay? Uh, so we talked about tenure track and non-tenure track. Um, so the first part for this adjunct, adjuncts are typically uh, part-time faculty, they're typically specialists, okay? So you've worked in a particular field, like you think about something like, say, securitization, okay? It's very, like, specialized. Um, uh, most sort of like general practitioners don't have that much of an idea about something that specializes, say, securitization. So Carlson, what we have is we sp specifically have a securitization course taught by a specialist who used to work in that type of secur securities. Um, and then so that's what sort of an adjunct is, where you bring sort of like some expertise. It's like it's a class that's specialized to that particular um, expertise, uh, and it's just you're in. You sort of teach and then you leave and that's basically it. Outside of that, there's not too much responsibility other than just teaching the class. Um, and then there's also lecturers. So at Carlson, we have quite a number of lecturers. These are sort of full-time teaching faculty. Uh, to give you an idea, uh, I'm a tenure track and at Carlson, there's only, when you're tenure track, it's basically research oriented. I teach 10 credits for the whole year and I can get all my teaching done in uh, one semester. And then lecturers, they don't have 10 credits, they have 24 credits. So they're basically teaching all year. The newer ones who enter as lecturers um, oftentimes have to teach in the summer as well. Um, there's some flexibility on when you teach, so you can schedule things. I know some of the lecturers like duck hunting, so they try to get out and they try to get a, their teaching obligations in October, okay, late October, November, and things like that. So it's a bit flexible. Other than that, I mean, you're, for a lecturer, you care a lot about um, participating not just in in teaching your class as well, but outside of that, like helping with students and things like that, fund managers and things as well. And then uh, for tenure tenure track, so this is the so when you first start, you're on tenure track. Then typically, in order to become tenured, you have to produce a certain number of publications and a certain quality of journals or things like that. Uh, so for my requirement. Uh, my tenure track length is eight years at Carlson, and they want me to have five A's. So A's are these journals that are either the top five in econ or top three in finance that you have to have publications in. And there's a huge process that I'll sort of speak about once we return to that. And then there's a distinction. So once you're assistant, you're on tenure track, then you make this threshold, you're typically tenure. Uh, and then after, if, you've, if you're a tenured associate professor, in order to become full, you have to have a certain number of like, you know, citations, and you've got to be moving up and have sort of like visibility in the profession, which is very subjective, and that's typically how you become full. 
Um, there's teaching schools and research schools. I believe we have a slide discussing yeah, we'll them. About that in the yeah, so then we'll return to yeah. those two. And I'm at, a, I'm at a teaching school, so my tenure process is a five year process, and I publish in A or B journals. So if you're in a teaching school, you have less of a pressure to publish or perish in an A journal. We'll talk more about it, but I have a, a lower threshold for publication than, than Colin would. Mm -hmm. uh, but I teach 27 credits. So that's a little bit uh, brutal. <laughs> <laughs> this was the this is the difference between the adjunct and the lecturers, the, the just the teaching track. So I guess there was teach selected classes, subject extra matters. It was for the adjuncts. Uh, no. Yeah, and there's like no advising. Uh, you're not expected to be on an academic committee like a tenure promotion committee, a sabbatical committee, things like that. Uh, you're generally sharing office space. Um, adjuncts are really coming in and uh, teaching their subject knowledge. So you talked about a securitization expert. We have a lot of adjuncts who teach uh, business law um, or something specialized like that. Um, universities are universities love adjuncts because adjuncts are less expensive for the university. So uh, universities uh, try and balance the teaching quality and the research quality and also, you know, running a business. Um, so there are more and more adjuncts and fewer and fewer of us. Do you think that's a fair statement? Sort of. <laughs> Let's say that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, and this was the lecturer, the people who are just uh, teach uh, basically full time. Um, like I said, sometimes include some of them, but most of the more senior type of lecturers get that off. They can have enough flexibility to do that. Uh, commitment to teaching excellence, so this shows up in many different ways. One is sort of teaching evaluations, and the other one is just helping out around, around the school and being an advisor or even just writing recommendation letters for undergraduate students and helping them with their theses, uh, things of that nature. Um, benefits commensurate with experience, I guess, is a statement, yeah. yeah. Adjuncts, <laughs> adjuncts are underpaid. And then the rest of us, it really depends where you are, how much you're publishing, what your seniority is. Yeah. And this one is your? Uh, this is me. So uh, if you're at a teaching school, which would be like a smaller liberal arts school, not a university, uh, Bethel is a faith-based institution, so I'm, I'm in a true teaching school. I generally teach three classes in fall, uh, one class over J term, and three classes in spring. Um, I spend as much time on my non-teaching as I do my teaching, even with that course load. Um, I spend a lot of time in academic advising. I spend a lot of time writing recommendations, mentoring students. I'm on the sabbatical committee, so every week I have a meeting where we're looking at uh, uh, applications for sabbatical and then also reports about sabbatical. Um, and then I'm uh, the faculty advisor on the student managed fund, which is a, a lot of time. So I guess the point is, if you are at a teaching school in a tenure track position, you're not, you're doing way more than than teaching. This kind of um, notion that people work sort of part time, even in a full time job, is not true. Uh, most of my friends, when they heard I was going to make this transition from industry to teaching, were like, "That's." Great, you'll have your summers off. Let's do mahjong on Thursdays. <laughs> and um, it just doesn't happen. Um, it just doesn't happen. You're either, you're either doing your research, which is a full-time job, or at a teaching school, you're doing some research, but you're also doing uh, some of this. You're, you have enormous student interaction, which for me is the reason to do this job. Um, just interfacing with the young people, um, touching their lives. Um, I can have a 10 minute conversation with a student that will literally change the direction of their life. Um, and that is a, a, a joy and a privilege. Um, and salary and benefits really depends where you are, how long you've been there, et cetera. Adjuncts are underpaid. Um, and I think a lot of teaching school faculty are, are underpaid. Um, but there are an awful lot of other benefits. Um, there are also tangible benefits, like a tuition benefit. Um, that's a real perk if you have children that are going to be going to school. I know at Bethel it's an extraordinary tuition benefit if you've been there X years, and I know at the U there's a, a great benefit. Um, often the benefit is higher if your child goes to the school where you teach, but you also do get benefits if your child goes to a university within kind of a network. So for Bethel, if your child goes to one of the Christian colleges, there is also a very significant uh, tuition benefit. 
So that is how a lot of young faculty can justify making a lower salary because it's worth real dollars to get the tuition break. I don't know if you have wanted to uh, No, I think. There's, there's, I guess one thing we're at the top, the course load number is just to inform those things. So, um, man, it was 313, I guess that's three sections or yep. three classes in the fall, three in the winter okay. slash spring semester, and yep. then one in the summer? We have J term. So and one okay. in J term, none in the summer. That's I see. That's do the research. Okay, okay. The J term is between now and yeah, January? Yeah, J term is uh, about a 30 day term from uh, like January 3rd through. February 1st. Yeah, okay. Okay, the year, okay. And then so mine is a course load of a, what, a two and a half, I know. So I just teach in the fall. So I just teach in so September to December. I teach uh, sort of two sections a week. Um, and then uh, in the f in term B, term A, I teach two sections a week in term. Uh, in term B, which is from late October to the beginning of December, I teach three. That's, that's two and a half over the year. Um, so uh, Carlson's very good about minimizing um, non-research activities for me. So research is um, basically what I'm paid to do. The senior faculty make that very clear. They say, um, they, they don't want you to be a terrible teacher, but as long as you're good enough, then that's fine. They're not pushing you to become excellent in teaching. That's not what you're hired for. You, you're, you're being pushed to become an excellent researcher. So they want you to sort of, once you sort of get to a certain level of teaching, then that's it. You just sort of become, that's the level of it is. Some professors, once they get tenure, they choose to become much better at teaching, put a lot of effort into it. But when you're on tenure track, you're sort of, uh, by assumption, time constrained, and you have to put all of your effort into research. Um, so I teach face to face, it's about 120 hours where I'm teaching in front of students for the year and the rest of those hours, like during the year or whatever, it's you know, 2,200 hours per year or something like that. So 2,000 hours I'm just doing research. Um, so doing research is writing academic papers, the typical page length is about 50 pages. Um, the whole process from start until finish is probably probably about four years. So the first year you're sort of doing the analysis, which is either the mathematics or the statistical analysis towards writing the first draft. The following year you present it at conferences and at different schools to get feedback. You incorporate that into your paper as you go and then the final two years of that four-year process is sort of sending it to a journal, You're getting feedback from anonymous referees uh, who are typically jerks. Yeah. And then, uh, and then, uh, and then, uh, Finally meeting their demands and then sending it back in and then finally getting the editor or the co-editor to say this is acceptable for publication. But it's four years. So in, like I said, for my tenure track, which is an eight-year process, I need to have five A's. So I need to start now and have this layered up. And so uh, I'm not sweating yet, but I'm about year four in my eight-year clock. Yeah, question? What would be an A publication versus a, a B? So for me, they were very clear. They sort of, at a, at a very, very high school, like a, the, the top school, like, like Chicago, Warden, Harvard, there's not like, a, there's not like a, th a number that you need to do. It's like subjective, it's impact. So then it's just sort of like this subjective thing. So there's been people who've been tenured with like two publications and like the American Economic Review, which would be one of the top two publications. So at Carlson, they're a little bit, we're sort of not in the top tier schools, so the senior faculty say you just sort of need a number. They don't want to be bean counters because it's sort of like, you know, lowers the stature of their department versus a top school. But they say so they sort of want five. So the top journals would be uh, American Economic Review, Journal of Political Economy, Quarterly Journal of Economics, Review of Economic Studies, and uh, Econometrica, which is impossible, uh, and then for, me, for myself. And then the finance journals would be Journal of Finance for sure. That is definitely the top journal. It is very hard to get papers published in there. There's a lot of work you have to do. Uh, and then Journal of Financial Economics and Review Financial Studies. Those are the ones. Um, and then a B would be for, uh, for Christian universities. There are a couple of very specific Christian business journals and conferences. Um, also, if I got published by the CFA Institute, that would count as a B for me. Okay. Uh, but it's just, it's like you're probably thinking, oh, that's really a low bar. It's, it's the public. I mean, it's it's still time consuming, and you you are peer reviewed. It's just at a at a lower level of competition. Mm -hmm. okay. Colin, you you made the comment, uh, which I think is kind of interesting about the uh, 
the researchers and teaching, and they don't want you to be terrible. Yeah. Uh, so I did a part-time program at Carlson, and okay. one of the complaints I would have on occasion was uh, I didn't feel like I got my money's worth out of the class because yeah. I didn't think that the teaching was that great. Yeah. I was probably a researcher. So who judges that? And so there's, there's student evaluations that happen at the end of the year, mm -hmm. and then that gets boiled into a number. And if that number is too low, then you're a bad teacher, and you have to improve. If the number is above a certain threshold, then you're fine. Okay. Yeah. Do you have like oh. a faculty development team, or do you get observed by your department head? Once you once you're over the threshold, which I am, then I don't hear anything yeah. about it. If you're consistently getting bad reviews, then there's a problem. Then the senior faculty say you have to change what you're doing. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So there's a threshold. Um, part of it too um, is uh, I don't I don't know. A, Part of it too is what, like, some students are generally interested in the class. Mm -hmm. Like, there's a difference between teaching an elective class and teaching a required class. Yeah, the required one, the students have to be there. They do not want to be there. <laughs> they want to be and out. Yeah. yeah. The, elect, the elective ones, they just, they are way more willing to put in the work. It's more engaging class experience and stuff like that. It's very noticeable between the two. And so it's tough. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I get like research is just like very difficult, I would say. Um, and so the faculty know that that's sort of what keeps the image of the school mostly. They're all researchers, I guess, and that's sort of what they think about. And when you go to conferences, there are people very aware of what school you're from and what re work you've done and how you think about issues and whether or not they should take you seriously or not. So it's all very geared towards research. So the students see me and they say, oh, you're just, you're just you're teaching here all the time. I'm like, I just, you know, I don't even know why I teach because I don't think I'm that great. Like, you could honestly find someone who's incentivized to do well at teaching and do that, but I'm Currently not. Yeah, um, and then teaching's the exact teaching university is the exact opposite. For the first three years, you have a faculty development team that's observing you, training you. I had to go to like eight sessions my first year, my second year, where they're giving you teaching tools and teaching you about different teaching methods. Um, my department chair observes me every semester. I get a formal write-up. There's like a teaching development team that offers like incremental programs, uh, which I can take advantage of. Um, but yet, I'll be the first to say that there's researchers who know a lot more than I know. Um, so it's sort of, you have to decide where your heart is as a, as a teacher. And also, parents in the room, you kind of have to decide what's right for your child or help them decide what's right um, if you're making the, you know, where do you want to go decision. So I think you're getting a really good blend of, uh, you know, the we're sort of the extremes of research and teaching. Um, so my research is, is a very small part of my work, um, but the teaching is important. And if, if I get a bad uh, student review, even if the class average is high, I'm gonna have a one-on-one -on -one with my boss about it. So it's just a very different environment. Mm -hmm. You had said before you, you don't, uh, you're not incented to work harder to be a better teacher. Yeah. What, what would you do to be a better teacher if you want to? Would you make it working closer with the students, or would you go to seminars? Uh, so for, for me, for me, I put in a, a little bit of effort every year, like a couple weeks. I concentrate and try to improve my slides and try to make the class a little bit more engaging to students. So at the end of the year, in addition to the, the student evaluation forms, I ask the students, I'm like, just think about what, what you liked in your other classes so that I can add it into my class and make it more enjoyable for you. Because I teach a class on fixed income securities, right? Like these are undergrads coming into my class. This is almost their first finance class. And it's sort of boring material, to be honest. I told one of my friends, um, I teach fixed income. He's like, that must be really boring. Yeah. And as it sort of is. It's not, I say it's not quite accounting, you know, but, <laughs> but I, I make jokes about this. Uh, and so some students just find it very hard to be engaged. So I, what I try to do is I try to bring in like market news about I try to stay on top of this uh, and just bring a sort of real life perspective to class. And then other than that, it's like group work in class or having assignments done in class or having more computer work like typing and coding in class and things like that. There's different things, but you got to get feedback. And every student, so some students are just like, yeah, you're great. You don't need to change anything, right? But then there's other students where they're just like lecture less on the board. And some students are like, don't do like a 
mathematical derivative in class to calculate duration or something like that. But some students are just like, I love that because this is what I need to learn in order to advance in quantitative finance. So there's always two sides to what you do in this. So I sort of just take the, you know, the middle road and update my slides a little bit, just try to improve them. Try, try to be clear, I think, is the main thing. Just clarity helps most and just going at a, when I first started, I didn't know about teaching and all that. My teaching responsibilities as a PhD student were basically nothing at Warden. Uh, but I started out way, going way too quickly. And I've since slowed down the pace a lot and just really made sure that the average student is sort of on board. And that's helped me tremendously in ratings as before it was like, yeah, I'm too smart or something like that was the review that I would get. And I, did, I always thought it was funny because like, what's the opposite? You want someone who's just yeah. like dumb enough? Just <laughs> dumb enough for, yeah, he's just perfectly dumb to teach this class. Like, I didn't really understand that sort of thing. But it, it's subjective, basically. But I just, I just, for me, it's teaching, like I said, this, I get a, or a certain threshold. Um, I don't f feel comfortable going in and teaching to a bunch of blank faces. Just physically to myself, it makes me feel sick. So I've put it on myself just to make sure I don't have blank faces and people are nodding and getting along and they sort of get my jokes and stuff like that and are engaged enough. It's hard like with, you know, my class, I don't know what size average class size. For mine we have max of 65 but most of them, like you know, 55 some students end up on average. Um, and then it's very hard to get, to really influence some of these the, these students' beliefs, but what, like Amanda said, every, I think the way that I feel like I'm truly influencing them is when they come by office hours. Mm -hmm. And then it's just sort of a one-on-one, -on -one, and that's what makes like teaching really enjoyable. But there's only like 10 students out of the 55 who are sort of active in class, out of the 65 who are enrolled, and 10 of them are just not there. Mm -hmm. but I'm only with them for seven weeks. I'm not their dad. I can't change their behavior. If they want to show up and pay thirty or $40,000 a year and skip class, mm -hmm. that's all I can do. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think, I think you hit on all the things I would say, making it interactive. We have to recognize that 20-year-olds uh, uh, learn differently than I, than I did. Like, short attention spans, they don't do a ton of pre-reading. It's got to be interactive. They love when you link it to the current markets. Uh, they love technology interfaces, so I try and use a couple of technology tools that are interactive. Um, but engaging them. Yeah. Really engaging them, linking it to the markets, you know, having them read 60 pages in a chapter, coming in and doing 20 slides doesn't work with Gen Z or Gen Z now. Yeah. Um, it's almost like entertaining. It is. One of, one of, <laughs> it is. One of my colleagues uh, calls it dancing. And I say to a student who's disengaged, hey, I'm up here dancing. Because you are perform you're literally performing. Um, yeah. Because it's a lot of effort to keep them engaged. Okay, well, we're making the classic professor mistake. We're going to have to race through our slides. Really? No, no, we're doing great, aren't we? What time are we done at? Mark? What time are we done? How much longer? Nine. Oh, okay. Nine. Oh, we got lots of time. Oh, we're good. Yeah. Is this you or me? Uh, I don't know. You have the PhD. You take we're doing both. Yeah. Um, so do you need a PhD? So for adjunct and lecturers, it's a teaching time faculty. You don't, like a MB MBA, CFA. I think would be perfect. Yeah. Um, and then so tenure track, it depends, I guess. I'm not sure if there are, you said that you need to have half the school has yeah. to be. So if you're at a teaching school that's accredited, and Bethel is, a lot of them are, uh, half the faculty has to have PhDs to be an accredited business program. So um, those people are at AQ, academically qualified. I don't have a PhD, I'm PQ, I'm professionally qualified. I do need an MBA and my CFA. So in my department, uh, most everybody has a PhD except for the accounting and the finance professors. We all have MBAs and then they have CPAs and we have CFAs. So sure. AQ is academically qualified, that's you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> PQ is me, professionally, you're both. You're sort both. of. Yeah. Um, I would say there's a hierarchy, like if you don't have a PhD, you feel a little bit like you're not quite as respected as the rest of the group, no matter where your undergrad or grad is from. Um, and um, Today's graduation at Bethel, and I will wear my regalia, and I'll have this stupid little hat because I don't have a PhD, and the PhDs get these really cool. <laughs> so I might actually go to PhD just for the cooler. Regalia. Yeah, so, it's not worth it. Trust me. Yeah, I don't know. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Do you want to say anything? Yeah, for, for for me for research faculty, you have to have a PhD for sure. Like, there's just no way you're going to be able to. Do the you need like the intensive coursework just to s 
learn the stats and the math in order to be able to understand the papers and then you need another couple years in order to read a particular literature and understand where the frontier is. It's very time, and time intensive, labor intensive type field so you absolutely need to have a PhD. I say preferably from a top school. It's, it's just there's a huge networking thing that there's like a, the publishing side is this real evil side to it um, where it's like a corrupt part like cronies no there is I'm serious you think it's like all merit based it's not it's like literally when you send a paper to a journal and it goes to the refereeing process the referee knows who you are and they know if they like you or not and they know if you have an agenda that's against yours and it's, so it's very much if you get a referee who likes you, sort of a friend, and they've seen you in a conference, it's just way more likely they're going to accept your paper. And so this refereeing process is sort of random. So there's been studies and like senior people have talked about this where they just, you can just send your paper to the top three finance journals and you'll just get comments all over the world. There's no like correlation across them at all. It's just some person's feelings about whatever there is on the paper. Um, and then so it just helps tremendously to have this sort of like network from a top school where the, your advisor knows a bunch of people and then that makes it the, refer, the referees more sort of sympathetic to your paper and your adjustment. The way that you approach problems is more from like a top school perspective and things like that. It helps tremendously. If you're, unless you're a stellar person, okay, which like, yeah. Everyone basically is not, but right, except for some very few lucky people, you, like the network thing helps tremendously, like for average students, average people. Right, so uh, is that sort of the dark side? The, uh, I guess I would look at a couple of hierarchies. There's where you have your education from and the importance of that, and maybe does the school you're actually at matter too? Yeah, it's both. So there's there's definitely like a, a a name brand value, especially when you're getting hired um, as a junior professor and they know nothing about you. It's very hard to because research just takes so long to develop. It's just like it's like lifelong thing. You sort of get well, hopefully you get better at it over time. Um, but when you're starting out, you're sort of very very new. You know, like now when I speak with people who are graduating four years from now, I just speak with them about concepts, and they're just like, oh man, they're so clueless about certain issues because they just haven't been in the field, and it just takes so long in order to fully understand certain types of things. So just having that indicator that says you came from a top school gives a strong signal that you know you maybe have a, more of a network or things like that nature, subjective stuff that ultimately helps you succeed. Um, but it's an imperfect world for sure. There's lots of students who graduate from top schools and they're stars on the job market. They get flyouts at all the best schools, Chicago and MIT and things like that. And then they just do not make it. They get the refereeing process, how random it is. They just end up getting unlucky and then it builds on yourself. Yeah. Is yeah. there any benefit to building your social profile and network? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's like, that's the whole reason we go to conferences basically. Yeah. yeah. Like number of so LinkedIn is not so, in academics, it's so small you sort of know everyone. You know, you know, you almost know everyone by name. Like eventually, like going to a couple of years, like you go in and you sort of, because there's only like, you know, call it 50 top schools or something like that. Do you know what I mean? Um, and then... Building broader acceptance or name for yourself, is there benefit in that or you're really trying to it, gain among that? It's, tr it's within that group, and it's particularly in the group that you work in. So I work in sort of like this field called macro finance. So it's sort of an intersection between sort of macroeconomics and sort of finance. And so there's like maybe uh, 20 people who are very senior in that field and very influential. And then outside of that would be sort of I, what I would hope is what I'm sort of in, which is the top, one, a hundred, top 100 or something like that in that field. And then it's very important to have a good rapport with that top 20 because those are the ones who write your uh, tenure letters and things like that. And those are the ones who sort of run the show and make the de big decisions for the conferences about who they're going to accept or not. So it's very important to, to have good relations with these top people. Yeah. And it's just, uh, this is what I mean about this corruption network thing, preferably from a top school. It matters more than you think it does. And you go to every conference you can, right? 
Uh, I don't. Yeah, <laughs> so, right. uh, some people are very aggressive and they go to some things. For me, I just, there's, I got like young kids and stuff like that. Yeah. And I think as long as I, if I show up and I do a good job at the conferences that I go to and they say, oh, Colm put a lot of effort into discussing this paper and he was very helpful and we sort of like him, he's a nice personality. I think that's enough. I don't, I'm not killing myself to go to all these conferences all the time and stuff like that. I'm trying to, but we'll see. <laughs> we'll see if that was the right strategy. Yeah, so far I'm okay. So how much does that uh, corruption influence <laughs> the types of items that you're researching and the perspective that you're trying to bring? Um, so it's not... I'm just saying there's a dark there's a dark side for it what has to do with story what it has to do with a lot with like who you know and that's like not merit based and that's why I call it corrupt um, so for me for work I mean um, I don't know I get I, I feel that um, the papers that I'm writing are still somewhat appreciated like I'm not I'd be working on them whether or not they were corrupt, I guess, or something. If, if the world was corrupted or not, I'd still be working on these ideas because I find it interesting. I think that's probably one of the bigger uh, perks of being an academic researcher is just working on topics that you like. Um, but there's just a lot, there's a lot of tastes out there, right? And a lot of like ideas in economics, I think, are not that original, to be honest. Like it's quite obvious. You just you don't need that much education or learning in order to talk about something that's going on in the world, right? I mean, like the Financial Times and Wall Street Journal sort of get most of it, right? Like 80% of it, they're sort of there, and then there's this 20% that's maybe still disputed that academics would maybe go into and think about and stuff like that. And even Times, was, you spend a lot of time talking about it, like why do firms pay dividends or something like that, right? Um, like I still don't think there's a total agreement on it. Some people have a strong bias, and it's just like, it's obvious why they do that. Well, well then why do they do this then? Right, and so it's like there's debates that are unresolved. Um, are there but, like taboo topics that you think could be interesting, but you're like, that's never going to fly. One of these top three journals will never approve that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So sometimes you start off with a, a certain paper. Uh, for for me, I feel that I'm not writing one of those papers. So that's a point of the senior faculty to sort of guide you if it's interesting or not. Um, and then so it's easier to be guided into a good direction if you're at a good school, which again has to be where you forgot your first job and things like that, so it's really built on itself. But there's definitely some topics that are just, you can tell the analysis that they're doing are just not, it's not compelling work, and it doesn't seem to be big up front. Um, I can't think of a particular topic right now that would be um, uninteresting to like the general finance audience. But that's a difference between it being boring because no one cares and it being salacious, right? Like, yeah. we're just sort of, like, like heretical. And yeah. It's against the, you know, the common wisdom, right? Like, that would be something where I think that'd be more frustrating. E oh, yeah. Yeah, no, no. So that, so that would be, um, there's been, okay, that's sort of like what uh, the idea of tenure is, I guess, where once you get tenure, you can write a paper that sort of tries to upset the status quo a lot. But when you're on tenure track, it's much about trying to say you're trying to be part of the club. Yeah. I think that's a great summation. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what after, there's lots of ridiculous assumptions that we use all the time in our models that we do. We all know that. <laughs> um, but uh, there's defenses of them uh, as well as why we use it. Sometimes this comes down to tractability and things like that, unfortunately. Um, but the idea behind tenure is once you get it, then you can write this paper that says you can't we can't keep writing models with this sort of particular assumption because of the, there's so much evidence that's against it, right? Um, but oftentimes in economics, it's not like, it's not like physics, right, where it's a hard science, where like it's true or not. Do you know what I mean? Like things can survive that are untrue in economics for a long time. It's like efficient markets hypothesis or something like that, right? <laughs> and then if you ask people, Right? Even that concept, it seems crazy because how do you have such a massive asset management industry even though those markets are efficient, we should all just have passive index funds. Um, some people believe it and some people don't to certain degrees, you know what I mean? And it's not necessarily true or not true, right? It's sort of like an organizing principle. So is that valuable? Sort of, right? I'm not sure. If you were teaching a, a, like an entry level finance class, yeah. you would have to teach EMH as part of the curriculum, right? I think so. You need to mention it. Yeah. I think you need to mention it, yeah. But then you would, 
I think you mentioned that this is sort of an idea where there's no point, you should just put everything in a passive index fund, you're being ex compensated for factor exposure. Um, and then just say, well, there's also these huge CIP deviations that happen at the end of every single quarter and stuff like that. That's where there's arbitrage, visible arbitrage, predictable arbitrage in these currency markets and things like that. So that's completely against sort of being able to make money. You, like, you can make money on public information or whatever. It's type 2 market efficiency and things like that. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I think, um, yeah, I'm not sure if I answered your question. Yeah. I, I can go on, as you can tell. <laughs> uh, transition, in case you're interested. Uh, I'll take that. Yeah, sure. All right, so we both transition from industry. Um, so I would say this notion that it's you know an easy job or you get your summers off, I mentioned that already, is, is false. It's incredibly hard to build a class or to prep for a class or to teach a class the first time. Um, the scholarship is demanding, particularly at the research uh, institutions. Um, students are like the peer, like the peer people that Colin's talking about, who are uh, on the dark side. Students really expect a lot. They expect you to be extraordinary teachers. They expect you to have a lot of time for them. They expect the course to be pitched at exactly their ability level, even though there may be, you know, 30 or 60 in your case uh, in the class. So it's it's quite hard to please all the students all the time. Um, and you, you often will get an outlier on a, on a, on a review. Um, this Gen Z, I alluded to this before, it's very hard um, for 20 year olds in today's society to be focused for long periods of time. So the days of a lecture, like a professor at a lecture and teaching are over. It really has to be, include technology, include current news, include board work or small interactive exercises. Uh, I teach investments, so we often will break for a problem set, well, they'll price the security, for example. Um, uh, we're all very busy in the summer. We, it, is a, it is more flexible, though. So it may not be less work, but it's more flexible work. So that is a huge plus. Uh, quite a few faculty in my department will only teach Monday, Wednesday, Friday. They're working Tuesday, Thursday, but they could do it from home. Or they can maybe have a, you know, a different not-for-profit commitment that they're available for. Um, so it's not less work, but I, I would argue that it's more flexible work, uh, mm -hmm. at least for a teaching university. Um, but the rewards are great, and I, I've already mentioned how the, the student, Colin has too, the student interaction is really, um, it's just fantastic uh, to spend time with 20 year olds who are learning full time. They're just a really interesting and uh, engaging and wonderful uh, slice of, uh, of a community. Um, I love my peers, too. Uh, the colleagues that I work with are all like-minded. Um, we're all lifelong learners. We all have a heart for service. So the, the rewards are great. Um, I don't know. Yeah. You want to talk about your transition? Um, so mine was shorter. So I only worked in Toronto for like a few years before going to, into a PhD program. I applied for PhD programs two years in a row. The first year I got into some good schools and then my boss, uh, who also had a PhD in control engineering, he sort of convinced me to try out industry for a year. And I had a great time. I thought it was, a, um, it's a good thing about industry is you work with a lot of like-minded like people and you're sort of in the same, uh, whatever, same bunker together. Uh, and then there's just sort of like that social element that's sort of more absent in academia where a lot of the time you're just working by yourself. Even though you've co-authors, you meet with them once a week or something like that uh, if you're actively engaged in a particular project. But it's a lot more time where it's just sort of by yourself and it's not necessarily for everybody. Um, and then, yeah, I just realized that after my master's program, if I was going to go do a PhD, I initially had this idea where I was going to wait for 10 years and then go back and do it. And it would just be, looking back at that strategy now, or the strategy which I did pursue, which was just work for a few years and then go into academia, do a PhD program right away, I realized that the waiting for 10 years before going back into it wouldn't have worked as well. It's just very much like, a, you look at a lot of the PhDs coming out of these schools, and they're just, they've done nothing but academics. And, uh, and it's, some of them are totally fine with that. They've never worked like a job. They've just been, came from like a fortunate family. They went to 
MIT and then Stanford, and that's basically their life. And they're pretty good academics, to be honest. They explain things well and they cover tough topics. Um, so you're sort of at a disadvantage in some sense where if you wait 10 years, you're trying to learn like these tools that just young people have a better ability to pick up. Um, and so I sort of tried to maintain being relatively young, I guess. Yeah, I'm not sure. You mentioned the attention span mm -hmm. issue. So, do you teach any night classes that are three, four hours long? And if so, how different is the teaching there than in one hour? I don't, but my colleagues do, and they they put breaks in where you do group work or you literally take a stretch break. Mm -hmm. Or uh, we have night classes that are once a week for three hours, and the faculty there will break for like ten minutes right in the middle. Yeah. Um, but it's a lot of like small group work. Get up on some whiteboards in small groups or. Uh, you know, talk with your table mates about this topic and one of you present what your group has decided. So forceful interaction. Um, uh, I, yeah, I, I teach mostly uh, 70 or 75 minute classes, depending on which class. And even at that length of class, I, I can't just lecture. So it's a lot of little caselets or small group work or a technology interactive exercise. All right. Ah, do you want me to go or are you going? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Right, yeah. Um, so, what are the students talking about? The students are obsessed with Bitcoin and blockchain. Uh, it's all they want to talk about. Um, which, and I'm sharing this with someone in the back. Um, I'm old enough that that didn't exist when I was in industry. So it was fun for me uh, when I took over the capital markets class. Uh, one of our colleagues who taught it retired. Uh, it was fun for me to get up the learning curve. So I just, you know, part of teaching is staying a little bit ahead of your students. You just have to always know this much more than they know at least. Um, so they care about Bitcoin and blockchain. Um, they talk a lot about behavioral finance. We, we talk a lot about uh, like efficient markets and we link it into behavioral finance and there's a little sort of, we have like two camps in the finance department. Like some people believe more in behavioral finance. Uh, I'm sort of a fundamentalist. Um, so the students know that, and we have a lot of sort of fun discussions about that. Um, and then we talk a lot about ESG. Bethel is a faith-based institution. So we talk about ESG and then more specifically about biblically responsible investing. So I would say that all of these one-off conversations that happen in my office hours or in the hallway or, hey, can you recommend a, a book for me to read or help me understand this, are all in these three topics. Um, I would say specifically about technology and data, our business analytics uh, minor uh, emphasis is growing in size. Mm -hmm. So we have more and more students who want to get into analytics um, than, let's say, economics or HR. Um, so we have a business department with a bunch of emphases, which I guess most people would call majors, and the, the business analytics one is growing exponentially. Um, students know that that's what employers want. A lot of our alums who come back uh, to hire Bethel grads are asking for students who are uh, stronger quantitatively. So I don't know if yeah, no, we, we have a, Carlson started a Master's of Science of Business Analytics a few years ago and that program has completely taken off. It's like this huge demand from employers and there's like really, I think it was one of the earlier ones that started in the country uh, and there's a strong demand um, from employers and the students that Carlson gets who admit into that program are very strong mm -hmm. students, yeah, quantitatively especially. Yeah, and I actually, when I was at Parametric, we try to hire people out of that program and there aren't enough of them. I like, see. Um, if you want to teach, if you could teach that subject, that's where the job opportunity is. Mm -hmm. Because schools are looking to hire quantitative adjuncts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the, the comments that I had about the students, um, it was just sort of me getting used to teaching. Like, so when I was a student, I was a good student, and then so. Um, what I thought teaching was, was the, from my perspective, where it's just like, hey, you put in a bunch of work when you're not in class, you learn about the material, and you go ask the professor like, while they're teaching, and then, uh, and then that's sort of good. I was like, oh, so I could be a teacher, because I can work at things, and then I can 
discussed that and students who I like tutored over the years, they said maybe I'd be a good teacher and things like that. And then once you become a, the professor and you realize that there's only some few students in the room who are that keen <laughs> and most of them don't want to sort of be there if it's a required class, then it sort of changes your behavior. And some of them just change about, like I said, some are excited about the learn so that those are the students that sort of make teaching very enjoyable where they ask you about what stuff, what's going on, uh, and they're just intellectually like curious and that's like really rewarding and some just care strongly about grades so they just want to know the bare minimum that they can do to get an A. Some are totally fine with getting a B yeah. and some just you know there's other ones. I don't know why they're in the program. I guess do if they don't show up. Do you find that you have uh, different abilities? in your class and how do you handle that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So for the, the biggest difference in ability, the biggest distribution of ability within a particular class that I saw was in my MBA program where I'm teaching an intro fixed income class and I have students who have passed level two in the CFA and then there's some students who don't know what an interest rate is. And then, so then how do you teach there the, the CFA students are just like, I was like, so why would this be there? Like, because of that. I was like, oh, perfect. Everyone gets it, right? <laughs> no, they don't. So then at the end of the class, Professor Ward went too quickly. I was just like, okay, well, you know, what can I do, right? So it's hard to find the average student. Yeah, and I think that's the challenge. And then do we teach to the average? Yeah. You want to challenge the good students. That's right. So you, so you got to the interject little these little things, these little <laughs> derivatives and stuff like that, yeah. And then the good students hopefully come up and say, I appreciated that. Um, more and more students interested in work-life balance. When I went to, to my master's, which is sort of like a half MBA at Toronto, uh, there's a strong finance industry that most of the students wanted to go into investment banking and work the 80-hour weeks, like that's no problem or whatever. And here I find more and more students at Carlson, they just don't, they think that's just ridiculous. Um, it's not true, like it seems like a lot of the truly good students, the ones who I can tell are just like are very smart. They do go into investment banking uh, and are just are very hard workers and things like that. But just lots of them are more like they don't even consider that career. So then you're not going to be in finance. You're not going to be choosing the big paying jobs when you get out. And that sort of changes what the average salary is and why students go into finance and things like that. The shift towards work-life balance, which um, this sort of change, I guess, the dynamic of yeah, students. Yeah, and I find this too, and what's interesting is, well, I'm from New York and did the investment banking thing. So, like, I look at them and I say, when you're 22, you should be working 60, 80 hours a week. Like, yeah. That's when you ramp it up yeah. before you have a family or yeah. health issues or your parents are ailing. When you start working 100 hours a week, yeah. you mean, yeah. Yeah, and, um, <laughs> and these guys haven't had a bad job market. So, like, my yeah. undergrads have four job offers. And it's like, oh, well, where can I work 40 hours, get a you know, 4% match? It's like they've been courted by employers. So I yeah. think if, this, if the job market turns around, this may change. But I was shocked at how much they care about work-life balance. Yeah. Because I feel like they should want to work a little harder at the front end, especially. Yeah, right, yeah. It's time for work-life when That's you right. have a life, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and it does change, because I graduated my undergrad in 2008, yeah. before mm -hmm. you know everything fell apart. Yeah. I went into a master's program yeah. uh, in the fall of 2008. Yeah. And so when I graduated my undergrad, every all the accounting and finance folks had four job offers. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, then uh, when I was graduating in 2009, we had out of like 20 people in the, it was the MSF program, yeah. Yeah. Um, three of us had job offers and yeah. it was in corporate finance, not yeah. the banking everyone else wanted to do. Yeah, I see. Yeah. I wonder if this will change. You know, I think it will, but anyway. And then the Friday nights is yours. I don't know what you meant. Yeah, I could just tell when I was teaching the late Thursday classes that students just wanted to get the heck out of there. Yeah. <laughs> They're like looking at the clock way more during the rest of the classes. Uh, the other thing too, I wanted to talk about Bitcoin where it was like, where it was reaching whatever 19,000 in mm -hmm. December last year. I was getting emails from old friends that I've spoken with in yeah. years. They're like, hey, are you in Bitcoin? I'm like, now I know it's a bubble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, stu and so students, who are, students who are just so interested in it then and asked me about it and then since it crashed and I have, haven't heard of it since. Well, uh, it's like the Dutch tulip craze or whatever. That's right. Yeah. Well, it'll go on our bubble charts. Right? That's right. We'll start with the Dutch tulip. Yeah. Now we'll end with Bitcoin. Yeah. Instead of the housing. So we'll see. Yeah. What they're interested in just changes over time. That's what I was saying. Yeah. And I think that's our last slide. Yeah. Oh, no, this is important. So how do you get involved? So if any of you, obviously, you're interested in the topic, um, 
being an adjunct is sort of the first step. Uh, the, even the teaching school tenure track positions are, are pretty rare. Uh, I know Bethel and some of the other universities do use the job board. But there are plenty of things to do. So adjunct, adjunct is important. So the way to do that is to reach out to people at the universities and just let them know what your qualifications are and that you're interested. Um, you can also uh, get involved through these avenues as well. So um, there are how many, 16 teams on the CFA Research Challenge? Uh, we're down a little bit this year, I think okay. 10 or 12. Okay. Yeah. So the CFA Research Challenge is a pool of college students and also their faculty advisors and their industry advisors. So I would highly encourage you to get involved with that. You will, you will very quickly and efficiently meet faculty at all of the local institutions in the, in the finance department. Um, so I would encourage you to be either an industry mentor or um, a grader or a judge. I know that you guys are looking for graders at the moment. So that is a really good way to get plugged into the academic community here. Research schools are part of that. Teaching schools are part of that. So you would actually efficiently meet a lot of people. Um, Carlson has a fund. We have a fund. Uh, St. Thomas has a fund. A lot of, a lot of schools have student-managed investment funds. So get involved there. Literally, find them on the website, phone up the contact on the website and say that you'd love to come in and um, observe, be a board member, uh, <coughs> lecture, come speak to the students. Uh, it would be a way for you to get on campus, make some connections, see if you like the environment. Um, be a guest speaker in a regular class. I bring in guest speakers to my investments class, my capital markets class. Um, and then you can be an alumni mentor if your university happens to be local. We've got a couple Bethel grads in the room who are involved in multiple ways um, through this uh, this list. I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, no, I just uh, get, so if there's some people that I've met uh, over the years and they've come and given me uh, a, as a guest speaker in some of my classes. I teach a sort of a quantitative financial econometrics class. So if you do quantitative investment management, um, we should talk. And then I also teach this undergrad bonds class where I, it's for me it's harder to find people who work in fixed income, I guess. Um, it's sort of got like this trading bent to my class. So if you've ever traded in fixed income, just to communicate how that works for students, I'd be happy to have you come and talk um, in my class and things like that. You meet a bunch of students, they're just engaged, just you know, meeting the mm -hmm. nice 20 year olds who just have tons of energy and stuff like that. Sometimes it's really, people like, especially if you went to Carlson, they sort of like give back to the mm -hmm. community and things like that. So we should just chat after if you're interested. Yeah, and you're welcome to come have lunch at Bethel, maybe observe a class. Mm -hmm. I'd be happy to do that. All right, I think that's it for us. Yeah, any what? other questions? Yeah, I'm just curious what Gen Z. Mm -hmm. uh, and all of the kind of student review impacting your, your teaching grade philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you try to ensure that you're keeping academic academic rigor high, or how do you balance academic rigor with pleasing the students? Yeah, that's exactly the. It's an excellent <laughs> question. That's sort of one of the big questions. I think it's your personal integrity. And I'd rather get a low score and know that my grads are qualified to graduate um, and you know, uh, be contributing members where they work. Um, so I, I have the luxury of not really worrying too much about it. Um, I know other faculty maybe who are younger or have spouses at home who maybe um, worry more about their job security. That's a, that's a real issue. But you, I mean, you've hit the nail on the head, and I think it's about personal integrity. Um, so I could dumb down all my classes and get straight fives, you know, and like make it a fun game on their phones every class. I really could do that and get straight fives and have, you know, maxed out classes. But it's a personal integrity issue. Um, and then the, the, hopefully the hierarchy in the department. Like I have a very good department chair, very good colleagues, so um, they would catch wind of that and. Remind me that we're accredited, and that's not the correct way to do it. I mean, it's a concern in industry from mm -hmm. a hiring perspective. Absolutely. Uh, and so, I think it's it's going to be interesting to see how how well the academic integrity can mm -hmm. uh, uphold, given that there's. Yeah. So what you as an employer do is you look for accredited programs because there's a lot of work to stay accredited. Uh, you look for like published CPA pass rates, published CFA pass rates. So there are some metrics that employers can use to kind of judge the academic integrity of the university. 
Um, and if the university is accredited and uh, they have credible statistics that show that their grads are successful and contributing, um, then you know that there's a process in place that holds the professors accountable to not teach to the grade, you know, our grade, our review. How much are uh, for students and or I guess recruiters that, are, that recruit from Bethel mm -hmm. or, or from Carlson or what have you, um, how many kind of have ins with the faculty and get the, you know, the good list of students, you know, uh -huh. to, to versus just going to a job fair and getting everyone that walks by? I know. Uh, Do you have an answer? To, I can answer. I can answer for Bethel, but I, I, like, parametric where I used to work. I mean, they will call me and ask, and I'll give them the list of the good students. But I also do that for other people. So we have an advisory board on the fund. The advisory board will say, you know, can you recommend a couple of students? And I'll share that name. But I, I'll basically share the names with the student's permission to people who ask that I know are reputable. Um, the CFA challenge, we often get asked by employer. Employers come and watch. We all often get asked by people in the room, oh, could you share the emails of you know, those three students that I was impressed with? And if the students allow me to, I will do that. We're, we have a lot of privacy regulations we have to deal with. So I will do it for someone <coughs> reputable that I know that asks for anyone, but obviously parametric basically <laughs> as, a, as a pipeline. A permanent pipeline place. Yeah. I don't know how you handle that. No, for me, for me, I don't. Uh, I sort of live in a bubble. <laughs> uh, I have to, unfortunately. Um, and then what I get is a, a good student will come to me and they say well, they want a letter of recommendation or something like that. So I've written some of those things and it's been mixed success. I've had some students get great jobs off of uh, letters of recommendation from me and other faculty there, and some I think it, they got maybe second round interviews, but it didn't pan out or something like that. So. Um, on the flip side, not from the industry perspective of finding the top talent, but from the student side, mm -hmm. do, you, do you think students know that there's a short list that, that get different opportunities? I think they know there's a short list, and I think the ones who care about the short list are on the short list. Okay. The, uh, Colin mentioned, like, in a class, I'll have 10% of the class engaged, working hard, doing extra stuff, asking the next question moving along the class discussion beautifully. You, like, you need yeah. two or three students in the class or you can't have it interactive. You need a couple that you can go to. Um, so those are the ones on the short list, but they're working hard to be on the short list. Um, mm -hmm. And then there are some that are just there because they have to be and they know it and you know it and they yeah. want to be an out or a C and out. Um, yeah, I don't think the system's broken or whatever. Like the good <laughs> students, you can tell. And then I, sometimes I'm like, I wonder where that one guy went or after he was working. I'm like, oh, he got a really good job. I was like, okay, good. I was just thinking about the comment on the, you yeah. know, the quality or yeah. the security. Yeah. And, and my experience is there's always a short list too. And, there is a short and list. I think it works, like you said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you never want the integrity to, to lower for right. the average. Right. But right. The, I mean, I think the the talent gets to the right spot. Well, yeah. and I've, I've had people apply to parametric, and then the parametric person will say, you know, can you recommend them? And I, and I, I say nothing. You know? So, I right. mean, there's a, there's a short right. good yeah. list, and then there's, you know what, I have my integrity. I'm not going to recommend a student who's not working hard or doesn't have the ability to succeed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, I think we give a fair representation with the student's permission. Um, to anyone who asks, but of course, I mean, I've got a local former employer that I love, yeah. um, and it's, it's a fantastic place to work too, so I feel it's fine to, you know, send students there. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but students know that. And those types of students would never make it into that one. <laughs> well, I don't know. I have a I have a broad uh, I have a broad group of students. We love we love all our students. <laughs> What what drives academics back to industry? Uh, not getting tenure. <laughs> that drive yeah, me back. <laughs> maybe not getting tenure. And I would also say I think people misperceive how much work it is. And at a teaching school, people misperceive people misperceive the non-teaching responsibilities, and probably people misperceive how hard it is to get published in a, a journal. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. That's not like a. 
it's like this, I don't know, there's like this wall of death that's four years from me. Yeah. And I know that I, and I'm not there yet. So it's sort of like always on your mind. It weighs on your conscience. If you don't work for a couple days, like even over the weekend, you sort of get antsy and you're just like, oh man, I'm not going to make it. So it's sort of like this, there's, you know, it's not like, Colin it's not like a, ho it's not like a holiday that I'm on, right? Colin has a wall of death and I have like a, a low <laughs> style of worry with my tenure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I worry about it and it's work and I've got to go to conferences and get published, but it's not the yeah. level at all that a, like a, a yeah. research university deals with. Yeah. On the teaching versus research uh, school, and you mentioned from a parent's perspective. Mm -hmm. So, do you think the students benefit from all the research being done? I should say my daughter's at the Carlton School, right? Now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, it's hard to say what research. The benefit of it is, I guess, if you th if you even think about, like, say, the efficient markets hypothesis, right? Which, if you work in asset management, you sort of have to not believe it, right? You got to sort of believe you can add value, right? But then, do, was that beneficial to know or not? Do you know? Like, it's subjective. So there's some, there's some work. I feel if you work in a particular field. Um, so for me, when I teach this quantitative class, this financial econometrics class. Um, I'm not sh unless you've done these types of volatility type models and maximum likelihood estimation and things like that, I don't know how many people can teach it, I guess. So then if you're going to go and take the class, you definitely benefit from this type of work, which is very closely linked to some of the academic work that's been done, like the tools that are there. Um, but then the issue with frontier academic work, oftentimes there is conflicting evidence in economics. Like I said, it's not, it's not physics where there's a true or false. There's conflicting evidence, so it's not true if what you're working on is going to be continued to be valued and things like that. Do you know what I mean? Um, but I think there's a certain level of expertise that you learn when you become an academic and you focus on a particular area that I think would have benef benefits for students. It's sort of indirect benefits, I say, but direct work sometimes, but most of the time not. And yeah. I think probably particularly for the students at the top, like your brighter students probably benefit more. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The brighter students just figure it out themselves. You know what I mean? That's the, and you don't even need to. I don't, they're in school because they need the degree or something, but yeah. they're just self-sufficient, yeah. right? Smart students. And uh, you can have them work on your research with you. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's. That, I think that's a huge piece of it. If you're, if you're, if you. If you're at a research university, you can more easily do research with a faculty professor. We have students do research with us, but they're, it's a smaller group. Whereas at Carlson, you would have much more opportunity to participate in research as a student. Yeah. So I think that's a, a benefit of being a student at a place like that. Right. I'm going to call official time. All so right. We can thank you for, uh, for doing this.